Hello friends, it's uh, Jim with Science Talk. I have some more uh, stories from the world of paleontology to share with you. Headline, Before Crocodiles, the Hairless Coyote. And you're probably thinking, crocodiles and coyote, how on earth are they related? Stay tuned. Team of paleo paleontologists have found a missing link between a crocodile family and its small and graceful land-dwelling ancestors. The reptile looked like a hairless coyote with scales, says Catherine A. Forster, a paleontologist at Stony Brook University, who's part of a team that analyzed the recently found fossil of what is dubbed Jungarsuchus sloani. It has long thin limbs, narrow snout with sharp pointed teeth and a moderate tail and could move about quickly looking for a meal. The findings co-authored by James W. Clark of George Washington University and Jing Zhu and Wan Wang of the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing were published in a recent issue of the journal Nature. The creature's named after the Jungar uh, Basin, a desert region in China where the fossil was found, and after Chris Sloan, a senior editor at National Geographic magazine, who found the specimen. Before the discovery of Jungar Sukis, paleontologists had a strong idea that the crocodile's family ancestors included a group of graceful land-dwelling reptiles called Stenosuchians. Sphenosuchians had pointed teeth and were predatory carnivores, like today's crocodiles and its relatives such as alligators, caimans, gavials. And this family is typically referred to as the crocodilians. Unlike more uh, evolved crocodilians, which have short legs extending sideways from the torso, basically splaying out to the side, Sphenosuchians had longer legs that were directly underneath the bodies, much like dinosaurs. The heads were compressed from side to side, lateral compression, rather than top to bottom as in living crocodiles. Top to bottom is called dorso ventrally uh, flattened. They lacked the rigid skulls and broad surfaces for crunching jaw muscles found in living crocodilians, so the bones evidence for ancestry was murky. Jungarsukas clears this all up. The fossil skull has those broad areas for muscle attachment and indicate that the muscle for closing the jaw was significant. By analyzing the fossil's features and comparing them statistically with features of other reptiles, Clark, Forster, and their colleagues determined that Jungarsukas is a Sinosuchian and the closest ancestor to living crocodilians. Now, crocodilians moved about, that moved about in water evolved later, about 140 million years ago. The discovery of Jungasukas also allowed the paleontologists to show that this reptile and its closest relatives represent a phase in the evolution of crocodilians during which the group became highly adapted for living on land. Dr. Forsyth says, if the route from scaly coyote to crocodile sounds far-fetched, remember that everything has to evolve from something else. Birds evolved from animals that didn't fly. Whales evolved from animals that lived on land. I just did a video on whales and hippos. Now, it's also interesting to note that there's a group called the archosaurs, and the archosaurs gave rise to basically the crocodilians, these saurischians, which are the, the dinosaurs that have a lizard-shaped pelvis, and the ornithians, which are dinosaurs that have more of a bird-shaped pelvis. So, where Junga Sukas is in relation to all of these, I am not sure of at this moment. It will be interesting to see where they place that, if they place that before the archosaur branch or in between archosaur and crocodilian. My suspicion will be the, the latter scenario. So this kind of leads me to an interesting little side note here. 
um, related to what I was just saying. If you look at, because the coyote was basically, a coyote is like a mammal-like reptile. Well, there was a group of mammal-like reptiles that were called the thoracids. And these organisms arose in pretty much the early Permian and they died out by about the late Triassic, some 275 to uh, 205 million years ago. And as I said, these were mammal-like reptiles. And typically, if you look at mammals, and if you look at, the, uh, you look at the skulls of mammals, and if you look at the skulls of these therapsids, they had what were called synapsids, a synapsid-type skull. What is a synapsid-type skull? Basically, there's one pair of holes on each side of the skull behind the eye socket. Therapsids were, in essence, synapsids. And this hole is called a temporal fenestra, right? The temporal bone is what contains your uh, eustachian tube, your ear canal. Um, so we, so you have one opening, you know, called the temporal fenestra. Now, if you compare that with what's called the diapsids, diapsids are two pairs of skull openings that are found posteriorly above and below the eye socket. This allows for attachment of very strong jaw muscles. It also allows the jaw to have a open up wider than a synapsid counterpart. What are the examples of organisms that have diapsid type skulls? Lizards, snakes, dinosaurs, both the avian and non-avian forms, and crocodilians. So this was, if if uh, Jungersuchus was a synapsid, then obviously at some point in becoming the crocodilian line, they evolved a diapsid skull. Right? Recall that the uh, Jungersuchus had a uh, side to side compression versus a top to bottom compression of the skull. There are other groups of uh, skull types. One is a uriapsid which is one opening high above the eye socket. And this is typically found in the extinct uh, prehistoric marine reptile line. And finally, there's a, 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 another group called the anapsid, which are organisms that have no skull openings at all. This is typically, uh, uh, you find these in uh, the terrapins, turtles, and tortoises. Now, some paleontologists have said, well, this is the most primitive, and by most primitive usually means the earliest that shows up in the fossil record. So there are those paleontologists that think, okay, the anapsid was in the earliest form of the skull. We see these in the, in the turtles and so forth. And that later on, the synapsid and diapsid skull types evolve, making the anapsid a what's called a paraphyletic line, like right? paraphyletic. There are other paleontologists who are of the opinion that turtles actually uh, developed their anapsid condition from a diapsid ancestor. Like everything else, this is a debate that goes on in science, and it will be interesting to see where this comes down to. I am of the opinion that the former situation is more likely, that the uh, anapsid appeared first, and then the synapsid and diapsid uh, lines develop later on, uh, because turtles have been basically uh, stayed the same morphologically for many hundreds of millions of years. The next paleontological story I wish to share with you uh, involves dinosaur tracks. Fossilized track marks left by dinosaurs about, and this is the really exciting part of it, 170 million years ago, they found basically what they deduce it was a, a lagoon-like area at the time. Two types of dinosaurs. 
They basically have evidence for a four-legged herbivorous sauropod dinosaur and smaller three-toed clawed footprints. You guessed it, two-legged meat-eating theropods. Their relatives later on included uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor. Obviously, because of the when these fossils uh, tracks were made 170 million years ago, these are not from T. rex or Velociraptor, because 170 million years ago puts us in the middle of the Jurassic. Velociraptor, T. rex, or Cretaceous era. Okay. Now, this is really exciting because the fossil record from the Jurassic is spotty and poor. So this is exciting to get anything from that era. Fossils are just super rare from this time interval, study co-researcher Steve Broussard, a paleontologist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, said. Study co-researcher David Fofa, a doctoral student in the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh, found the track site in April 2016 during the, doing some field work. In all, the paleontologists found about 50 track marks, most of them left by the long neck sauropods. These dinosaurs stood likely about uh, two meters tall at the hip. Okay. Measured about 15 meters in length and weighed more than nine metric tons. Some of them left footprints as long as 70 centimeters, 0.7 meters. The theropods that left the footprints were likely about six meters uh, in length and weighed not quite a metric ton. The largest three-toed uh, foot theropod footprint was about 53 centimeters in length. And uh, the person who relayed this information was the study lead researcher, Paige DePolo, also of the University of Edinburgh. It's unclear what species of dinosaurs left these prints, but fossilized track marks, just like fossilized animals, are given scientific names. It's likely that the sauropod prints are Breviparopus. Let me say it again, Breviparopus. Brevi means sh uh, short. A type of track mark seen at other sites. The theropod prints are likely those of Eubrontes, which have also been found at other sites. Again, from the rare fossil finds that we do uh, have found. The study can be found in the, was published in the April 3rd edition in the Scottish Journal of Geology. So, some interesting news from the world of paleontology, and just wanted to bring those uh, up, uh, share those with you. Uh, and you, I, I kind of like to throw in some ancillary material that's related uh, to, to what I'm sharing with you, as well as the fact that it's just an interesting information, I think. Uh, so, um, that's all I have for now from World of Paleontology. I'm, I, there will be more coming in the future. If you uh, like this video, uh, please share, uh, please subscribe, hit the bell. Uh, I hope you will consider supporting the work I do here by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa. If you're already a patron, thank you for your continued support. We'll talk soon.